Hey, Scott. Hello, Debbie. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. It has been way too long since we have gotten to chat. I think the last time we had a good sit-down was for Out of the Furnace. No. What? Not for Black Mass or Hostiles or Antlers? Uh-uh. And then we ran into each other after your lovely performance in Get Low. And we uh, chatted about that. That was my last performance. Yes. Well, never say never. No, 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 no. Jeff Bridges wanted me to, 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 to be in Crazy Heart. I got to tell you, mister, as much as I loved what you did with Out of the Furnace yeah. and the slow burn that you gave us and the... And you do this with all of your films. You have men who are loners. And it, it, it immediately casts a certain kind of ambiance on a film. Oh, uh, thank you. On a story. And you do this with all of your films. Hostiles, same thing. Black Mass. As much as I love what you did with Out of the Furnace, which I personally think was probably your best film to date. Wow. When My you, wife would agree with you when you look at every level of filmmaking, you blew me out of the water with Pale Blue Eye. Uh, thank you. Scott, this is riveting. It is mesmerizing. It is very methodical. It is very calculating. Your, visual, your visuals are stunning. And your visual tonal bandwidth is off the charts. I am so in love with this film, I can't tell you. Uh, thank you so much. This, this is the best way to, uh, to start the new year. That, and uh, just before I got on, I was checking emails and received the most gorgeous email from Walter Hill, who's someone I've long oh. admired, who had uh, written uh, much the same. So I'm really pleased to hear you say that. Thank you. Oh, and I'm tickled that Walter reached out to you. I adore Walter. Oh, my God, he's a legend. Yeah. Your inbox sure means a lot, I can tell you. Generous man. But thank you for saying that. This was, this was a real passion project for me. In fact, um, uh, I, I wrote it after I had written my first film, Crazy Heart. And, and then Christian and I uh, discussed it right after uh, Out of the Furnace. But Christian was too young to play uh, Augustus Landau, yeah. the character he now portrays. And he was too old to play Poe. So uh, we went off and made a couple of other films. And... and the timing seemed to be right, and, and I'm grateful that we did wait because I think he's a remarkable Landor, and I think Harry Melling and the rest of the cast are everything and more that I could have hoped for. Casting has always been one of your great strong suits, Scott. And here, you have knocked it out of the park. Harry Melling is Poe. Is We're seeing a younger, freer, lighter Poe. The prequel Poe. But there is something that Harry brings to it that is chilling. Yes, I would say uh, he. the only time I've ever seen Harry in a film or TV show was, was in the Coen Brothers, The Ballad of Buster Scruggs. Mm -hmm. And upon seeing his limbless performer uh, uh, evoke uh, what he did with Shakespeare and all the great poetry that he read, it, it really... Uh, blew me away, and I said to Christian, I found our Edgar Allan Poe. And I sent Harry the uh, screenplay. He so graciously put himself on tape, um, and he blew us away. And I sent it to Christian, and Christian said, why look uh, any further? He embodied uh, a Poe that, that, uh, that the audience isn't quite uh, accustomed to or ready for, because we think of Poe as the master of the macabre and the dark arts, and someone who's who is uh, morose and melancholy and, and prone to tragedy and grief. Mm -hmm. And of course, we, we see that in this film. But the, the Poe that, that Harry put forth is one who is warm and witty and humorous and, and prone to poetic and romantic musings. But someone who is alone in the world, um, much like Christian's Augustus Landon, mm -hmm. who, 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 who operates on the margin and is looking for a connection. And he finds that. Christian, and they develop a father-son uh, relationship. Very much the so. The film is a couple of things. It's a, it's a whodunit, of course, but it's also a father-son relationship, but it's also a, a, an Edgar Allan Poe origin story. Oh, very much so. Take place in this film, motivate him to become the writer he became. 
And what I find interesting, because I'm a big fan of John Cusack's performance as Poe in The Raven. Yeah. And being so familiar with that film and seeing this, this makes your casting of Harry even more significant in my eyes because I can see with the pale blue eye, with this origin story, I can see how Poe would have gotten to what we, what we saw with what John brought in The Raven. Oh, that's really interesting, and, and I'm happy to hear you say that, because now that I reflect on John's performance, which he's one of my favorite actors, Kuzak, that um, I can easily see that, that bridge. Yes. That's quite nice to hear, yeah. Yeah, uh, and I kept thinking that the whole time I was watching the film. I've only seen it three times already, just so you know. Whoa! Well, you know, Deb, my, I, I <laughs> hope that my films get richer upon repeated viewings, but, and never more so than this one, because... The breadcrumbs are laid for uh, uh, for the reveal, I think. Like, oh, your your reveal, and this is kudos to you and your editor, uh, Dylan. What an amazing job with the editing here. The entire film is very well paced. It's very deliberate. You keep us on tenter hooks, and you build and build and build and build. But we get to that third act, and we've got one reveal. Then we've got another, and then we've got this huge twist. And I almost fell out of my chair every time I watch it. Thank you. Um, yes, you know, we're making films in the most impatient of ages, and I like to stand against that Yep. Uh, with my deliberate style. But it's, but it's terribly difficult because whether it's studio heads or executives, producers, audiences, it's faster, 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 giving the audience no time to languish in silent moments, which is where you really understand who a character is. Um, and in particular, the last 20 minutes of this film, as is, is I'll call it, the ending. The ending is the most important thing in, in most any film because it's the last thing that you leave an audience with. And, and it's where you hope that everything dovetails and comes together in, 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 in such a way that's satisfying, that's surprising, that's emotional, that's uh, unsuspecting. Mm -hmm. So that you uh, love those last 20 minutes or... or really uh, make, or thrilling to hear because it, it, if, if those don't work, the film doesn't work. Right. Because we've had this great build-up and we've had these breadcrumbs. So you really want a payoff and you give a payoff and then some. Well, yes. And, and, and that, that took a day to shoot that particular scene. And it's really where everything comes together. The writing, directing, performance, Howard Shore's score to be able to uh, uh, really make it a, an emotional ending, hopefully one that doesn't deceive, but one that, or feel cheated, but also one that makes you question what came before. Mm -hmm. Really speak to this notion that nobody is who they appear to be. And nobody knew that better than Edgar Allan Poe. Yeah. Well, this whole film, nobody is who they appear to be. Yes. Every By character. Design. Yeah, right. Every character. And I love the film so much, I actually got the book. Oh, wow. Yeah, Louis Bayard is such a great... Oh, my God, he is. ...for creating this world. And I don't know how I missed this on release back in 2006, but I got to tell you, I mean, your adaptation is outstanding. But I have to say, something, well, something I really love what you've done here with your build-up all, and all is your cinematography is critical in this film, more so than any of your other films. What you and Masa have, have created here visually is, it is to die for, actually. You've got a visual tonal progression with your framing, with your shots, where you really start with wides as we're going through this investigation and as evidence and breadcrumbs are appearing. You come in a little closer, we pick up more medium shots yeah. before finally in the third act we get a lot of close-ups. You're mirroring Landor's investigation, which is stunning. And then you bring in the factor, the lighting. You strip out all color, you give us the, the but for the blues, really. We're in a winter white, which is all shades of gray, You but for the cadet blue color which is also carries through not just from the uniform but into the wallpaper in the Marquis house 
as well as Poe's eyes and Leia's eyes. It's the only blue we see. And then you bring in touches of red. And the visual composition, the visual grammar is sublime. I am so in love with what you and Masa have done. Deb, I would love to speak to you every day. <laughs> Thank you, because this is really, you understood the film on every level that, that Masa and I discussed from, from palette, from um, making the film feel like a noose is tightening, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is a, a, an important motif, uh, that, that the camera is one instrument in a concerto working in tandem with editing and production design and sound to create an overall like, experience. Masa believes like I do, when you move the camera too much, it won't mean anything when you most need to move it. It's like yep. an exclamation point. I mean, Hitchcock wouldn't move his camera or, uh, uh, or cut unless there's a reason. Yep. So uh, it was really important to me that, that Masa, Stefania Cella, my production designer, and uh, Kasia Willick and Mamone, that we were all rowing in the same direction and that we advanced the narrative as much as possible with images, even though this is a dialogue driven film. And together we all painstakingly recreate, recreate an era without falling into nostalgic overload. And Moss and I started, and Stefania, with Kaspar David Friedrich's um, German Expressionist uh, work, his paintings. Mm -hmm. We then discussed the, for, for the landscape, the exteriors, keeping a very controlled palette. Um, we then, it, then discussed the interiors as though lit by the Dutch masters, Rembrandt in particular. And then we looked at the work of Kubrick and Barry Linden, uh, how he uh, lit interiors with, with candlelight. And then Akasha, of course, to your point, allowing those cadet blues to punch through and then it would make uh, the reds uh, so much more important if you don't see them until um, the very... Um, uh, the pinnacle. The very end of it, yes. Where it all culminates <laughs> together. But it was an incredibly difficult film to make, I have to say. Difficult to access locations, minus four, minus eight below zero at times for long stretches. Uh, but it was all in serving Poe's macabre work. Mm -hmm. And you get that sense through the entire film. And yes, the fact you stuck a raven in there was not lost on me. Oh, good, good, good. Well, look, that was kind of cheeky. You had to. Um, but yeah, you almost have to. And um, getting that raven to stand still is not easy. But uh, nonetheless, uh, you can't make a, a, a film about Poe with a, with a little cheeky reference. And I also love some of the imagery, some of the, the blocking and the staging that you've done. Uh, where we're looking at a cadaver. And it's very similar to what has been portrayed in prior films like Mask of the Red Death. Ah, uh, yes. So there, any classic film fans are going to see this and be able to pick up on some of this imagery that is, and I, I'm, I don't know if it's deliberate or just happenstance because it works well, but you really have touchstones to... Poe at every level. Well, thank you. Well, for better or worse, um, I am a deliberate filmmaker, and and I guess one of my weaknesses is there are <laughs> there are many accidents. Yes. Um, so if if people don't particularly like something, well, then you know certainly you can blame me. But if you're making an Edgar Allan Poe origin story, and if you're saying that the events that take place in this narrative influence him to write and to become the writer that we all know and, and, and love, then one has to be very well steeped in um, not only his literature, but in some of the films that have been mm -hmm. made work to pay homage. And it was, I think, quite important for us to to do that for people who, who, who do read Poe's work or have seen these particular films. I just love those touches. And whenever something like that would pop up, that just filled my heart with glee, Scott. Now, you mentioned him once, and I have to talk to you about him. Howard Shore and the score. This score is so amazing. You've got a heaviness of death laced with mystery, but then the score ebbs and flows, like the running waters of that creek 
right there and the river right near the academy, or even like the flames that we see leaping up in precarious moments in the films. It's a very unique score. It's very satisfying, and it's very rich. Well, Howard is, is one of our great yes. Uh, his work with Cronenberg and Jonathan Demme and Scorsese um, are among my favorite scores. Uh, he and I discussed a musical voice that pushes the suspense, the tension, the peril. But, but no one writes themes as well or beautifully as Howard. And he has themes for the, Pandor, uh, for the Landor-Poe relationship. The West Point Academy theme, the theme of Landor and his daughter, or Poe and his love, Leah. Mm -hmm. All of those that course through with this kind of peril and tension and despair, but also moments of, of, of beauty. Because he said if you look at uh, Tchaikovsky's work and you listen to it, there are there are, there are moments that are quite ugly, but also scored quite beautifully. And Howard really did it, I think, uh, with great skill and excellence in, in creating, I think, a, a, a really fine score. And I learned so much from him, and he's such a gentleman. And I think uh, the score for this film is really quite superb. Well, and right down to the instrumentation, which really, it mirrors the period of 1830 with his instrumentation selections as well. That's right. Well, that was a part of our discussion. And so often in, in my scores, I like to score the landscape because we're all so influenced by uh, our, our environment. Mm -hmm. And we talk about what uh, instruments might be in use or popular at the time, whether it's, whether it's the banjo and out of the furnace, whether it's uh, uh, the brass section in this, the cello, um, all those sort of things that are quite deliberate in uh, evoking a certain era sonically. And uh, Howard is just, I mean, he's a master, and I can't say enough uh, about him in, in this particular score. Yeah, I have to tell you, Scott, on every level, The Pale Blue Eye is truly, this is an artisan's film. Well, thank you. I, I, I certainly love cinematography. I love production design, costuming, sound editing. Let's skip uh, Lefse, who's one of our great, Dylan Tishner, who's one of our great filmmakers, Howard's work. I mean, what I'm smart enough to understand is hire the best people to help you bring your vision to life. And these are among the best artisans working in cinema today, and I'm grateful that they all have joined forces with me because there really is, for me, no greater pleasure than um, making films and working with people that, that continue to educate me. As a, as a filmmaker, and six movies in, I, I, I um, can't wait to get to number seven. I've been around since Crazy Heart, and I will never forget our press day for Crazy Heart, the Spirit Awards, when the film won, you, you know, best first feature. Uh, I mean, such, and I was there for all of it, so to, to go on this uh, ride yeah. with you is just insane and I have to say you're to see your growth as a filmmaker in this film is astounding you have really come leaps and bounds as a filmmaker and it's a joy to watch Scott and uh, ha you. and having said that I've got one last question for you what did you in making the pale blue eye Learn about yourself as a filmmaker that you can now take forward into future films. Well, that is um, a very good question because you try to learn on every film that you then will take forward. And of course, each film requires a certain visual palette or sonic score, performances, um, but I would say that in terms of everything culminating together uh, harmoniously, uh, camera, design, costuming, and editing, I think um, those sort of things coming together in, in, in tandem and really understanding that the rewards are in the journey that you are making a film together, um, uh, advancing a narrative as much as possible with images and sound and costume and, and, and design, 
Um, because for me, as cliched as it, as it sounds, directing is always a quest for the truth. And, and I discover really what a film is about while I'm making it. And you bring your emotions and your skill that you have experienced throughout your life to your films. Um, and it's the synthesis of, of, of ideas that allow you uh, to tell uh, stories. And, and quite frankly, I'm more interested in films that push me into an uncomfortable space. I think the great danger is, is in doing safe work. I think with each film I want to be on unfamiliar ground because uh, artistic risk is, is one of the great pleasures of making art. Um, I don't make films out of fear. Uh, fear of what audiences or critics will say. I make films that 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 that, that I'm obsessed with because you you don't choose your obsessions. Your obsessions choose you, and you try to bring all of that into your filmmaking and your experience. I mean, I'm just a much uh, more experienced filmmaker than I was with with Crazy Heart. Crazy Heart and Out of the Furnace were all emotion mm -hmm. films from a very very young filmmaker. And now I've, uh, I've uh, r really come to understand filmmaking at a, on a, uh, at a different level. Uh, it doesn't make my films better, but it certainly makes uh, me more confident, makes the choices that I make feel more confident uh, and, and secure. Um, and it's really about having a team of collaborators, because I love uh, camera design, costume score, editing, sound design, all of those things. Having people that support your vision and see the film that you're making, and that is critical. And that also goes for the cast. I love actors. I was an actor. Um, I want them to, to feel safe. I want them to be able to take big risks, um, understanding that I'm, I'm going to protect them. And, and quite honestly, um, I think it's one of the great jobs uh, a person can have, which is being a, a film writer and director, and I'm eternally grateful for support and people like you, so thank you. Well, thank you, Scott, for making such wonderful films. I can't wait to see what you do next. It's You got you set the bar so high now, I don't know how you're going to top it. Uh, well, you know, it's, it's when you make a first film like Crazy Heart, and it, and it, um, uh, and it, and, it, and it changes your life, like a film like that did for me, ultimately, you can no longer toil in anonymity and become a better artisan. And you make all of your mistakes in public, <laughs> um, uh, which is the double-edged sword of, of having a film that, that, that uh, has a success at that first film. But I uh, will take that over the alternative any day, and I continue to make films that I would want to race out to see on a Friday night. That's really my litmus test. So thank you. Uh, it means a lot to chat with you. I'm a little upset that we haven't chatted in three films, but... I know. Here we are. But here we are. We will not let it go three films again. I hope not. Scott. Thank you. Such great questions, and, and your passion really has started my year off the right way. I'm glad. You st definitely ended mine and started it off perfectly. Oh, thank you. I hope to see you again. I hope that you have a healthy... 2023. We all need that. You too. And we will talk sooner rather than later, Scott. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, Deb.